We're going to start in two minutes. Two minute call in case anyone needs to use the restroom or get a drink for you. Please turn off your cell phones. Please do not whisper during the presentation because it's being recorded so that it could be YouTube. And we have very sensitive, excellent equipment. Whatever you say will be picked up. <laughs> we want to thank our sponsors, the Bayside History Museum, Calvert Library, and the John Hanson Chapter of the Daughters of American Revolution for sponsoring this talk today. It is a real pleasure to introduce Mary Haley Amen. She's 30 years she served as a historic house museum director with Park and Planning. She was in charge of Darnell's Chance, Billingsley, Marinetta, and she also served three years on the commission's Prince George's County Tricentennial Committee when they celebrated 1696 to 1996. Mary managed the History Division Library and Collections Department countywide for Prince George's County. She's involved with numerous special events, historic house restorations, exhibits, the War of 1812 Museum in Bladensburg. She developed the Patuxent Rural Life Museum. She retired in 2019 and we were fortunate enough to have her come volunteer at the Bayside History Museum. And we always have a lot of work for all the volunteers to do at the Bayside History Museum. But we especially appreciate her work with our Past Perfect Museum Software Collections because that is a very special skill to have. At the end of her talk, if you haven't already gotten our local book, North Beach, uh, you can see me when we're finished. It's for sale, $25. It's a benefit for the Bayside History Museum. But it's a real pleasure, Mary, to introduce you, and I'm really looking forward to this. Okay. Thank you all for coming. We're going to talk today about historic sites in Prince George's County, those specifically that are owned and operated by the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. That's the one and only time that I'm going to say that whole name. We're going to call it the Commission, or as most former employees, employees of the Commission call it, Park and Planning. So. We'll give you a couple sentences of an overview of the Commission, just very briefly. The Commission was established in 1927 by the Maryland General Assembly to be allowed for the acquisition of land for park development and long-term planning in Prince George's and Montgomery counties. In its 97 years of existence, the Commission has acquired over 35,000 acres of land. Let's see. It helps if you push the right button. <laughs> Okay. All right, we got it now. Along with all this parkland came numerous historic sites. The first historic site acquired by the Commission was the Calvert Mansion in 1949. The Commission was created in 1927, but then we had the Great Depression, World War II, so they didn't really get rolling until the late 1940s. Over the years, that number has grown to well over 144 historic sites at 56 locations. Together, they comprise an authentic representation of Prince George's County history, 
obviously they provide educational value, historical perspective, and they have a positive impact on the county's economy through heritage tourism. Some of our historic sites, Contract Aviation Museum uh, in particular, re receives about 75,000 visitors a year. So some of the attendances are great. The first part of this talk is about many and varied kinds of historic sites that the Commission maintains, and the second part is about the five historic house museums that the Commission owns. All in all, it's only, it's not that long of a talk, so don't worry. <laughs> the Commission obviously owns a number of barns because they are acquiring parkland. These barns are triaged and um, restored, or at least stabilized, based on age, their historical significance, the cost of restoration, that kind of thing. The Commission owns three historic schoolhouses. This is the interior of Nottingham School in Nottingham. They're used for one-room school programs. The Commission owns a country church called Dorsey Chapel. This one is beautifully restored. It was a ruin. I don't know if any of you ever saw it, but it's used for small, obviously very small, weddings. It's a rental. It owns, the Commission owns a Catholic chapel. This is Compton Bassett's chapel, chapel in Upper Marlboro. It was acquired as part of the larger Compton Bassett plantation site. The first picture is a 1936 picture of the chapel. It's already about 200 years old in 1936. You can see that it's suffering from some stress. The chimney has got some problems. This is the left-hand photo. The um, roof's a little saggy, and the, I think the door's missing. The middle one is the same chimney end after the commission acquired the property in 2010. And the last picture is the, the restored chapel in 2019. Good job, right? They did a good job. The commission owns two historic mill, mills. This is a Delphi mill in Delphi. It was acquired early on in 1951. And unfortunately, that's long before the historic preservation movement really took hold in the country. And they did gut this building. But it is, at least they say the outside, it was also a ruin. It's used for as a community center. The commission owns a really fascinating little piece of land in Bladensburg called the Bladensburg Dueling Grounds. It's in the middle of all madness of what's Bladensburg. There was over 50 documented duels that were fought here between 1807 and 1871. Um, Steve, naval hero from the War of 1812, Stephen Decatur, was killed here in 1820 by Commodore James Barron. They had a long-standing dispute over the results of a battle during the War of 1812. College Park Aviation Museum. The land is what's historic. The building is a modern building. It's uh, our most visited historic site um, in the commission. It was founded in 1909 for Wilbur and Orville Wright for the military um, aviation school. It was also the site of the first air mail service in the country between Washington and New York which started in 1918 or maybe 19. This is the interior of College Park Aviation Museum. It is a Smithsonian affiliated um, museum. It's extremely well done. I know the dinosaurs are prehistoric, but I threw it in anyway just to show you the many <laughs> very sites. The Dinosaur Park in Laurel. And this is the Maryland State Dinosaur. It's called the Astrodon Johnstonite. Did you know we had a Maryland State Dinosaur? I don't know. You can go there and dig for fossils. If you do, it's kind of like fishing, catch and release. You're not allowed to keep any of the fossils that you might find there. Peace Cross in Bladensburg, which is an overtly Christian um, symbol, obviously. It was a World War I memorial. It is a World War I memorial. It was the uh, a Supreme Court case in 2019 that decided that Peace Cross could be continued to be maintained by public funds. It was built between 1919 and 1925, so it's an early form of concrete that does require quite a bit of maintenance, really. The uh, Mount Calvert Historical and Archaeological Park, which is in sort of Croom area, it was the site of Charlestown, which was the first county seat for Prince George's County. There was never a whole lot at Charlestown. It did have a 1710 courthouse, stocks and a pillory, a church, an Anglican church, a couple of warehouses, maybe a uh, tavern, and a, maybe a couple houses. When they moved the uh, county seat to Upper Marlboro in 1721, Charlestown basically just disappeared. The house that you see in the background is called Mount Calvert. It's used by the archaeologists as office and exhibit space. It's been very nicely restored. There, that's 
the picture up top is they were um, repairing the roof, one of the, I mean the porch, putting back the original porch. <coughs> I was lucky enough to live at Mount Calvert for four years. The commission owns a couple of mansions that are not interpreted historically. Um, they're strictly used as wedding and rental venues, um, big money makers. Oxon Hill Manor, built in 1939 for Sumner Wells, and the Newton White Mansion, built in 1929 for Newton White. This is Abraham Hall in Rossville, which is now a Laurel Post Office, and it was the first African-American site in Prince George's County restored with public funds in 1991. So we're kind of late to the ballgame. It was an African-American beneficial society hall. This is the sons of Abraham and the daughters of Rebecca. Commission owns a couple other historic sites that I just didn't want to leave out. Concord is used by the Arts Division as an African-American art gallery, and Chelsea is leased to the Boys and Girls Club of, um, I believe, of, of America. We have Patuxent River Life Museums, which I had a big part in. It's in uh, at Patuxent River Park in Croom. All the buildings, except one, that are on the site were brought here to create a little village because they were in danger of being torn down or whatever by the owners. They didn't want them. This is called the Charles Duckett Freedman's Cabin. It was built around 1880 by Charles Duckett, who had been a former slave on the H.B. B. B. Truman um, Plantation in Aquasco. He had served as a landsman for the Vidalia, and when he was a free man after the Civil War, he came back to the H.B. B. Truman farm and built this cabin for himself and his family. The Truman family, know, who still owned the farm, did not want this cabin anymore. It was in very bad shape. So we literally numbered it, including all the chinking, and brought it to Tuxedo River Park and reassembled it. We also have a little kitchen garden that's associated with it, the docents that work here, they cook a lot. And we did some things so that we could make that happen without burning the cabin down. There is a modern uh, flue inside the chimney. It's also um, actually set on concrete block that are faced with fieldstone, make it look original. There's a moisture very, uh, vapor underneath the whole structure that the archaeologists put down. The little chicken coop behind the garden is from the Perry Farm. And this is the interior. A little fuzzy there. But. And this is, um, slide is just to show you the complex itself. This is the Dr. Cabin and a meat house from the Perrywood Farm. And in the distance is the Sears House, which was from um, the Bellevue Plantation behind Hyde Field in Clinton. And I purchased it at auction for a dollar. And uh, I had a voucher from Park and Planning that I could spend $3,000, but nobody wanted it but me. So uh, <laughs> an auctioneer said, who wants to give me a dollar? <laughs> anyway, so we hauled it overland and uh, restored it. It had never had plumbing put in it. It did have some electrical stuff in it, but it was restored and we furnish it and use it as part of the school tours that come to the park. We also have a blacksmith shop. This is a reproduction. It's not an original. It's based on a blacksmith shop that was in Aquasco. And then there was a tack room in there too. It's just, this all sits around the William Henry Duvall Tool Museum, which is, this is an interior of the Tool Museum. It's not just carpenters and trades tools, but also um, housewife's tools and all of those kinds of things. There's a couple of historic houses that are awaiting restoration dollars. You know, restorations, as you know, are extremely expensive. Well, maybe you don't know. They used to cost, you know, $2 million. Now they cost $20 million, $40 million to restore these houses. These pictures, the, the sites in this slide all look better than they do here. This is a 1936 slide of Hazelwood, which is traditionally in the town of Queen Anne. It's now part of Booby. And um, it's Really, it's one of my favorite of my 5,000 favorite houses in that it's, it's a three-part, very distinct architectural styles. The, the site on the right was built after the American Revolution by Major Thomas Lansdale Lancaster. It's a kind of tidewater plantation house, federal house. And then he built the 18th, Thomas Lansdale, built the American Gothic side um, around 1830. And they originally were together. In 1860, Dr. Archibald George came along and he pulled the houses apart and built the middle section, which is Italian 1860. So it's a pretty cool house, really. <laughs> commission, also, at the same time the commission acquired Hazelwood, they acquired Queen Anne Bridge. I don't think the commission probably wants to own the bridge, but it is slated for some restoration dollars. 
I don't know what they'll do with it when they restore it. You can't drive over it. There's no road on the other side. But um, Compton Bassett in the bottom right corner is an incomplete Georgian house. Very cool. Um, it's been stabilized. That's the, it looks better than it does here. The south wall um, ha is, has buttresses because the south wall is weak. But um, all these things will eventually probably get restored by the commission. But like I said, they're very expensive. That was the first part of our talk. Now we're going to talk about briefly about the five historic house museums that the commission owns and maintains. All of these sites are fully staffed in that they have a facility director, they have a budget, they have full and part-time docents, usually a librarian, program managers, collections managers. Most of our sites have housekeepers, and Riverdale has its own gardener. So this is the Surratt House in Clinton, formerly called Surrattville. This story tells the story of Mary Surratt. The, it's, up in the top right is a press piece that the Surratt House puts out. Um, it's a very hotly debated subject still on how much Mary Surratt knew about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. There's four books, examples of four books there that the, you can, the Surratt Society will gladly sell you in their gift shop. It tells this story in any way. The Surratt House was built in 1852 for John and Mary Jenkins at Surratt. It was this crossroads community quickly became known as Surrattsville. They operated a tavern in their house as, as well as a lodging space that you could rent for 25 cents a night. And it was the uh, post office. And when the Surratt District Election District was created, it was the polling place. Very busy little place. They also ran, the Surratts also ran a livery and stable across the road there. The Surratts were extremely um, pro-Confederate. They were slave owners. And when Mr. Surratt, uh, the older John Surratt, died unexpectedly in 1862, Mary Surratt and her daughter, Anna, moved into a boarding house that Mrs. Surratt owned on H Street in Washington, D.C. Isaac Surratt, the oldest son, was already away serving in the American, I mean, in the Confederacy, <laughs> in the Texas Cavalry, and John Harrison Surratt, the middle son, came home from college to run the tavern and the bar. John Harrison Surratt was quickly recruited, recruited by Dr. Samuel Mudd as a Confederate courier and a spy for the Confederacy. He also was introduced to John Wilkes Booth, and the, the John Wilkes Booth, David Harrow, all the other Lewis Powell, the conspirators from the um, assassination met at the Surratt House on many, many occasions. They stored guns and supplies there for the kidnapping plot that they were planning to do, where they were going to kidnap Abraham Lincoln, and John Harrison Surratt, part in this, was to quarry him, carry him, down to Richmond, where they were going to hold him hostage in exchange for the release of Confederate prisoners. How much did Mary Surratt know? I don't know. Some of the conspirators, because I don't know why I can't say that word right now, um, especially Lewis Powell, stayed at her boarding house in Washington, D.C. So, I don't know. It's still, they, it's still hotly debated. They don't even agree at the Surratt House. Um, John Wilkes Booth was a, he had it all. I mean, he was good looking, you know. He had a lot of money. He was a famous actor. He was very enthusiastic on stage. He had a big following of female followers. He, this is a, the one, picture on the right is himself and his two brothers in the play Julius Caesar. And it, it, for whatever his personal reasons were, he hated Abraham Lincoln with a passion. He thought he was a tyrant for not allowing Maryland to succeed from the Union during the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln couldn't allow that, could he? If he allowed the secession of Maryland, then he, the Washington, D.C., the capital would be surrounded by the Confederates. So that wasn't going to work. So um, anyway, he decided somewhere along the line that he was not going to kidnap. He was going to assassinate, which he did. On the night of April 14, 1865, he shot Abraham Lincoln in the back of the head. And as he jumped from the booth onto the stage, he yelled, death to tyrants, is what he was yelling on the way down. The, um, he broke his leg, as most of you know, when he hit the ground. This is a wanted poster, right? I'm get a little little thing here. Um, this is John Harrison Surratt. So they quickly knew who was involved in this assassination, this booth, and that's David Harold up there. So 
John Harrison Surratt was not personally involved in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. He was in New York. And he, when he heard the news, he quickly fled to Canada, and then he went to Egypt. He did come back eventually. He was arrested and brought back and was tried in 1867, but he was acquitted. His mother, however, was not so lucky. Mary Surratt was tried um, and hung July 7, 1865. Assassination April 14th. They're, you know, already executing these people on July 7th. So a little bit of a brush to judgment, maybe. This is Mary Surratt, Lewis Powell, um, David Harold, and the guy on the end is called George Azerot. And I always say his name incorrectly. Um, John Mokes Booth um, rode directly with David Harold to the Surratt house, where he picked up the guns and supplies and ammunition. And he um, managed to, uh, he, then they went to Dr. Samuel Mudd, who set his leg and they managed to make it over into Caroline County, Virginia, to the Garrett farm where Booth was shot and killed. And then, of course, there was a lot of conspiracy theories on whether Booth was actually killed or not. Um, I think he probably was. There was an autopsy in Washington, D.C., and no less than 10 people came and identified his body, people that knew him in life. So this is the inside of the Surratt House. It tells this epic period in American history through lots of events and lectures and things like that. <coughs> Excuse me, they have costumed guides. The Surratt Society, which is the friends group of the Surratt House, um, non-commissioned employees, they're all volunteers. They have so much money, and they were the envy of all of us other facility directors, that they not only purchased the house next door to use for a visitor center, but they purchased additional house behind to use as the John O. Hall Research Center on Civil War Studies. Bless their hearts, we, we're, we're, we're not. We're not. <laughs> the second house is the Riversdale Mansion. Any of you been here before? Oh, nice. We live a mile away. Oh, great. <laughs> well, it's a fun place, and it's beautifully well done. It is beautifully furnished. This is the entrance hall and the orangery. The parlor, some of our historic houses are still being furnished. This is, doesn't have its um, curtains. There's no hangings. And it probably needs a few more pieces in there. This is the dining room and the breakfast room. All very nicely furnished. Riversdale was begun in 1801 by the Steer family, S-T-E-I-R, from Belgium. They had fled um, during the French Revolution. And um, their youngest daughter, Rosalie, married George Calvert, who was a uh, son of Mount Airy Plantation in Riversdale. And um, when the revolution was over, the Steers decided that they were going to return to Belgium, which they did, and they left the unfinished house to Rosalie and her husband. Rosalie wrote, a, um, she didn't write the book, she wrote the letters that had been made into a book called The Mistress of Riversdale, and in that book, uh, in the letters in this book, she documented the construction of Riversdale, everything that they did down to the, all of the furnishings, and so that, those letters are used for the basis of restoring and furnishing Riversdale. She also talked about her gardens. This is the uh, site that has its own gardener. This is uh, ornamental kitchen and uh, urban garden that's maintained at Riversdale. Riversdale has an extended kitchen that is also a slave quarter upstairs, or was, and it obviously has costume guides that it's called the Riversdale Kitchen Guild and they do cooking classes, uh, cooking demonstrations, open hearth cooking demonstrations, and that kind of thing. Very popular, really. Most of our historic house museums have a visitor center component. This is Riversdale's um, next door to the mansion. Is this house, that's the visitor center, the staff offices, and that kind of thing. Riversdale also tells the story of Adam Francis Plummer. He was a slave on the Riversdale plantation. I don't. I don't know if anybody's ever decided if he was a, a natural son or not, I don't know. But he was certainly not treated like a slave, even though he was never freed by the Calverts. Um, he was given 10 acres, when he came to his majority, he was given 10 acres on the Riversdale property, out of the Riversdale property, where he could grow his own crops, he kept his own wages. He, when he married um, Emily Saunders, who was a cook on the Three Rivers Plantation, which was nearby originally, he was allowed to go there to Three Rivers on Friday evenings to Monday mornings. I mean, who does that, right? And then um, 
when his wife was sold to a, a new owner in Philadelphia, the Calverts gave him train passes and he went to see his wife. When he was free in 1864-1865, he remained at Riversdale where he was a paid uh, foreman and he uh, built a house and then a more substantial house called Mount Hope on the uh, Riversdale Holdings. So it's an interesting story and his descendants are still around. So the um, next house is called Marietta in Glendale. It was the home of Supreme Court Justice Gabriel Duvall, who was a Supreme Court Justice on the very first Supreme Court under Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Marietta is famous for its teas. There are a lot of teas there all the time. Big, big money maker, $600 for tea. So, Marietta has extensive grounds, more so than a lot of our other historic sites. It has 26 acres. This is the back approach. I wanted to show it because it shows Gabriel Duvall's restored law office. But most of the property is in the front. And because of this land, we had a wacky program. Not wacky, sorry. Um, I love the reactors. Um, we had a, a weekend program every year called Marching Through Time. And um, any military reenactment group that wanted to come could come. And we would charge admission to the general public. It made us quite a bit of money. And these guys, I love them, these guys, they would dig those trenches where the archaeologists told them that they could dig them. And they would live in them for the weekend. <laughs> so, yeah. Almost all of our rental, um, I mean, all of our historic house museums have a rental or a wedding component. It's, obviously, it's to raise revenue. Uh, we all do accept this rat house. They do not. They have a rent, they try to haul research center for conferences that they want. <laughs> they don't have weddings there. Dornell's Chanson up in Marlboro was built in around 1742. It's named for Colonel Henry Darnall, who originally patented the land. His descendants built the house. He did not build the house. <clears throat> it tells the story of Latisse Lee, who was a, a wife of um, Adam Thompson, who lived there in the 1740s, <coughs> and he built the house. And this, the interpretation at Darnall's Chance is primarily related to women's studies, both black and white women's studies. It's beautifully furnished, entrance hall. My friend Susan Reedy is the facility director there right now. She does lovely exhibits. This is the parlor and the dining room and an upstairs bedroom. Darnell's Chance also has a burial vault in the backyard. I was lucky enough to be the facility director of Darnell's Chance in 1988 when I first started. It's the same year that our staff, first staff archaeologist Don Crumbling was hired. And, um, Don and Doug Owsley from the Smithsonian excavated this burial vault in, I think it was 1991. It turns out there was nine individuals. It was totally filled with trash and gunk and dirt, all kinds of stuff. So they excavated it out. They did a beautiful job. Look how clean it is down there. And um, the bones were at the Smithsonian for about 10 years. They have been returned to the burial vault. It's not really on exhibit all the time. If you wanted to go down there, you could get permission to, but it is a burial site. So, I'm trying to respect that. The last house we're going to talk about is Montpelier Mansion in Laurel. Is that not a beautiful house? It's a five-part Georgian. It's one of the best examples of a five-part Georgian in Maryland. Tell the story of the Snowden family and their ownership of the Merkirk Ironworks and their employment of the numerous free blacks that lived in the Rossville Laurel area. It's also, again, very nicely furnished. This is, I think, the parlor, all the musical stuff. This is the stair hall with its very unusual painting, paint treatment along the stairway there, but that it was considered original. This is a bedroom. Montpelier was built in 1783, and it was visited on numerous occasions by George Washington, most especially when he was going to of uh, the Constitutional Convention oops, sorry, in um, Philadelphia. He would stop because Montpelier was on the main road from Washington to Philadelphia in New York. So most of our tours, I think I've probably gone pretty fast, but most of our tours end in the gift shop because we want you to buy something <laughs> to take home and show your visit. So um, that's where we're going to end this, is in the Montpelier's gift shop. So thank you very much. Yeah. And For those um, <clears throat> historic places.
places that are furnished, uh -huh. were you able to locate any original or almost original furnishings to go in? Um, no, for the most no. part, no. I think there's a couple pieces um, at Riversdale, and um, maybe a couple pieces at Montpelier, but for the most part, the commission had to purchase those pieces. Are the descendants around? Yes, they are. Oh. Uh, lots of them are pretty active in the mm -hmm. friends groups. All the all of our historic house museums have what's called friends groups, yeah. um, with the Surratt House being the mm -hmm. international friends group that they have there. Um, most of ours have, you know, 25, 50 people in our friends groups. Just say about Riversdale because we used to be with the friends. And oh, the nice. And meetings and it, and there would be a few uh, Colbert, as they would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Albert is the whiskey. Uh -huh. <laughs> I never heard that one, but I know. Well, we heard from a, from a caller, mm -hmm. and uh, occasionally they will get a piece from a descendant uh -huh. that was either from Rosalie's time or from her children's time. Right. And then, uh, and then are always adding to the collections. But uh, yeah, Charles um, Benedict Calvert, <coughs> the son of Rosalie and uh, George Calvert, founded the um, Maryland Agricultural College, which became the University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. So, for him to say that. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to add some things you were talking about sure. with the Surratt House mm -hmm. and controversies over the uh, Lincoln murder. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of things that are very interesting about uh, Lincoln's assassination. One of the theories about the uh, conspiracy, who was the brains behind first the kidnap plot and then the assassination? It may have been Judah P. Benjamin, the Confederacy Secretary of State. Well, you may be very well correct. I'm not a uh, scholar on but, that. You can go there and debate it with them, I'm sure. <laughs> but, um, I mean, no, no, you're probably correct. They, all aspects of the story of the Surratt House are still very highly debated. I mean, you go over there and they're back and forth. I think John Wilkes Booth was considered... He was pretty, but kind of brainless, and wouldn't have been really yeah. act, that active in planning a lot of the more serious things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the other thing, too, is that uh, not so much with the conspiracy, but the irony in, with the background with uh, the Lincoln assassination. A few months before Lincoln was murdered, his son, his eldest son, Robert Todd Lincoln, was a uh, army officer on a grant staff, and he was returning to Washington uh, from some business up in New York City. And at the train station in what was in Jersey City, mm -hmm. as he was trying to board the train, as it was pulling into the station, there was a crowd of people trying to all get on the train at the same time before it stopped. And he almost got pushed under the moving cars until someone grabbed him, pulled him back, and possibly saved his life. Mm -hmm. He turned around and looked, and he realized who it was. It was another, as I like to refer to him, a more famous and accomplished actor at that time. Edwin Booth, mm -hmm. John Wilkes Booth's older brother. Right. Yeah. Edwin Booth was in that picture. Um, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, enjoyed by Yes. Um, a bunch of years ago, I don't remember how long it was, um, Parks and Planning did a, a road rally um, mm -hmm. program at a variety of the, of the uh, houses here. We had a treasure hunt. Yes. Yeah. Oh. A treasure hunt, yeah. Okay, we only did that once or twice because yeah. people were speeding along. We thought it was on. a liability. <laughs> Yes, you went from Montpelier down to the Surratt Yeah, and I had right. never been to the Surratt House, mm -hmm. so I actually did the tour there. Well, you were supposed to take a tour of Montpelier, take a tour yeah. of Darnold's well, Chair. People I didn't. Had, they I just had, picked up whatever they needed to go and kept going. Well, see, I had been to most of them, and I've been a reenactor and a volunteer mm -hmm. at Riversdale, and I'd actually done stuff at mm -hmm. like, all of the houses there. Nice. Except for Surratt. Mm -hmm. So afterwards, I stayed for the tour. Uh -huh. the, probably the best docent I have ever seen. They do life. a great job over yeah. there. They really do. Mount and Vernon and Surratt House. They have the best docents. I wish, I wish you could do something like that again. It 
was so much fun, and people, you know, going to that all over the world. Well, we did. We changed it to a passport program where yeah. you would get a stamp. Yeah. You would have to go yeah. to the house and take the tour, right. and then you would get a stamp in your book, and you could turn that in for a possible prize yeah. kind of thing. Our program's coming back because I know before COVID, the different historic sites would have lectures and such like that, and I remember uh, going to a lecture at the Survivor House mm -hmm. on women who uh, dressed as men and fought in the Civil War. Yeah, quite a few. And yeah. yes, and it was a really interesting program because uh, we were because the whole group of us were talking. Well, how about so and so? And it's just like, and the problem is that with COVID put paid to so many things and it's really hard building back up again. It is. It's been slow. And their quasi-government parking planning is, so it took probably even longer. You know, yeah. a lot of people were still working at home, <clears throat> all that kind of thing. But um, I retired in 2019, right before COVID. Yeah. So yeah. I wasn't party to all that yeah. COVID and business there, except for my former co-workers. And building up your volunteer base back in a way. Yep, they will. Because they find other interests, they move, pass <coughs> on, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was wondering about the um, Compton Bassett Chapel. Uh -huh. Is that located near the Patuxent River? Yeah, you know, if you're going over Patuxent River, um, over Hills Bridge, the Compton Bassett was traditionally owned by the Hill family, Clement Hill. Um, he was the surveyor general for the Western Shore under uh, Charles Calvert. Anyway, the Hills lived there, Hills Bridge, they built the bridge. Except the descendant did. If you go over the bridge, it's immediately to your right. That wooded area that you see there, that's all Compton Bassett Plantation. Any plans to, for public access? It has limited public access now. You can't go in the house, the historic house, the mansion part, because it's <laughs> unstable. But you can take a tour around the grounds, the cemetery, and the chapel. The chapel is beautifully restored. It has a full six foot ceiling basement and a Priest's quarters upstairs. It's been very nicely redone. Was that a chapel of ease? Um, no, it's a Catholic chapel. I mean, it's not a chapel of ease in like what we would think of. They did the, the circuit. Okay. Yeah. You know? I was just thinking it's like because it wasn't used all the time. <coughs> it was not. The, the priest would go from Melwood mm -hmm. to Mount Airy to His Lordship's Kindness and we'd travel around different Sundays. Is Parks and Planning in Boston? Um, Boston, no, it's owned by the town of Bladensburg. Oh, yeah. yeah. Since I got, I um, want to thank you for your work with the Rural Life Museum. So oh, you're right. one of the volunteer blacksmiths at the blacksmith shop. Nice. I really appreciate Well, they don't you know did. you, so you must be fairly new. In 2015, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. But thank you. <coughs> so, we Excuse me. We developed Protects of Rural Life Museums in 1990, no, 1999. So, 2001. Yes. So I wanted to clarify something. Okay. That, that <laughs> told this woman. The, 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 the Hills House, uh -huh. which is uh, a few hundred yards maybe up the river from Hills Bridge. Uh -huh. So that driveway, Yep. It, it's, uh, that's, uh, it's legal to drive back in there? There's a new driveway. <laughs> it's a, there's a new driveway. That oh. driveway still exists, where you kind of have to go against traffic to turn into the driveway. It's kind of scary. There's a new driveway farther up Marlboro Pike. Mm -hmm. Further up Marlboro Pike. Next time you drive by there, just look. You can see it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I finally remembered what I was going to ask about. Is, okay. Is with the mm -hmm. Queen Anne Bridge was it? Uh huh. Queen Anne Bridge. If if it's in a place or a position where they can do a bike trail or walk the trail. Possibly. It used to go from Queen Anne Town, which was a port town created by the assembly, um, into Anne Arundel County. The Anne Arundel County side no longer has a road there. There's a road on the Prince George's County side. So it's used It's used a little. It was one like they could fish yeah. on it occasionally or off of it occasionally. Anybody else? Yes. Are archaeological and or architectural surveys available for all of the parks and planning properties? Um, probably. I know architecturally, yes. Okay. Um, as far as the archaeologists, um, I'm not sure on that one. They've done surveys on all of our historic sites. Whether they're public documents, I don't, I'm not sure. You can find them through the Maryland Historical Trust. They keep, they keep a uh, file on everything. I, yes, I use that quite a bit. I was wondering if there was anything else available. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yes. Eric, do you know anything about what's going on with Hazelwood? You showed it. And there. Hazelwood is stabilized. It looks a lot better than it looks there. It's been painted. All the windows have the protective wooden things inside them that look like real windows, if you know what I mean. And um, it also has a breathing system in it so that it can breathe. It had a tenant in it for a while, but it didn't last particularly long. And right now it's just sitting, it's sitting and waiting. So we used to occasionally give some tours of it, and we would require the tenant to open it up to the public, but not not recently. Not 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 that I know of since 1999. I mean, not 2019. I mean, when I retired. So. If you need <laughs> no. Oh, you guys. I have some. Thank you. But this is a bad season. It, it is. Yeah. Well, I'm like this all year round. I can't even play <laughs> <about> this season. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thank you.